A Bell's Biography, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hearken to our neighbor with the iron tongue. While I sit musing over my sheet of fool's cap, he emphatically tells the hour, in tones loud enough for all the town to hear, though doubtless intended only as a gentle hint to myself, that I may begin his biography before the evening shall be further wasted. Unquestionably, a personage in such an elevated position, and making so great a noise in the world, has a fair claim to the services of a biographer. He is the representative and most illustrious member of that innumerable class, whose characteristic feature is the tongue, and whose sole business, to clamor for the public good. If any of his noisy brethren, in our tongue-governed democracy, be envious of the superiority which I have assigned him, they have my free consent to hang themselves as high as he. And, for his history, let not the reader apprehend an empty repetition of Ding Dong Bell. He has been the passive hero of wonderful vicissitudes, with which I have chanced to become acquainted, possibly from his own mouth, while the careless multitude supposed him to be talking merely of the time of day, or calling them to dinner or to church, or bidding drowsy people go bedward, or the dead to their graves. Many a revolution has it been his fate to go through, and invariably with a prodigious uproar. And whether or no he have told me his reminiscences, this at least is true, that the more I study his deep-toned language, the more sense, and sentiment, and soul, do I discover in it. This bell for we may as well drop our quaint personification is of antique French manufacture, and the symbol of the cross betokens that it was meant to be suspended in the belfry of a Romish place of worship. The old people hereabout have a tradition, that a considerable part of the metal was supplied by a brass cannon, captured in one of the victories of Louis XIV over the Spaniards, and that Bourbon princess threw her golden crucifix into the molten mass. It is said, likewise, that a bishop baptized and blessed the bell, and prayed that a heavenly influence might mingle with its tones. When all due ceremonies had been performed, the Grand Monarch bestowed the gift than which none could resound his beneficence more loudly on the Jesuits, who were then converting the American Indians to the spiritual dominion of the Pope. So the bell comma our self-same bell, whose familiar voice we may hear at all hours, in the streets comma this very bell sent forth its first-born accents from the tower of a log-built chapel, westward of Lake Champlain, and near the mighty stream of the street Lawrence. It was called Our Lady's Chapel of the Forest. The peal went forth as if to redeem and consecrate the heathen wilderness. The wolf growled at the sound, as he prowled stealthily through the underbrush, the grim bear turned his back, and stalked sullenly away, the startled doe leapt up, and let her fawn into a deeper solitude. The red men wondered what awful voice was speaking amid the wind that roared through the treetops, and, following reverentially its summons, the dark-robed fathers blessed them, as they drew near the cross-crowned chapel. In a little time, there was a crucifix on every dusky bosom. The Indians knelt beneath the lowly roof, worshipping in the same forms that were observed under the vast dome of St. Peter's, when the Pope performed high mass in the presence of kneeling princes. All the religious festivals, that awoke the chiming bells of lofty cathedrals, called forth appeal from Our Lady's Chapel of the Forest. Loudly rang the bell of the wilderness while the streets of Paris echoed with rejoicings for the birthday of the Bourbon, or whenever France had triumphed on some European battlefield. And the solemn woods were saddened with a melancholy knell, as often as the thick strewn leaves were swept away from the virgin soil, for the burial of an Indian chief. Meantime, the bells of a hostile people and a hostile faith were ringing on Sabbaths and lecture days, at Boston and other Puritan towns. Their echoes died away hundreds of miles southeastward of Our Lady's Chapel. But scouts had threaded the pathless desert that lay between, and, from behind the huge tree trunks, perceived the Indians assembling at the summons of the bell. Some bore flaxen-haired scalps at their girdles, as if to lay those bloody trophies on Our Lady's altar. It was reported, and believed, all through New England, that the Pope of Rome, and the King of France, had established this little chapel in the forest, for the purpose of stirring up the Red Men to a crusade against the English settlers. The latter took energetic measures to secure their religion and their lives. On the eve of an especial fast of the Romish Church, while the bell tolled dismally, and the priests were chanting a doleful stave, a band of New England rangers rushed from the surrounding woods. Fierce shouts, and the report of musketry, pealed suddenly within the chapel. The ministering priests threw themselves before the altar, and were slain even on its steps. If, as antique traditions tell us, no grass will grow where the blood of martyrs has been shed, this should be a barren spot, to this very day, on the site of that desecrated altar. While the blood was still plashing from step to step, the leader of the rangers seized a torch, and applied it to the drapery of the shrine. The flame and smoke arose, 
as from a burnt sacrifice, at once illuminating and obscuring the whole interior of the chapel comma now hiding the dead priests in a sable shroud, now revealing them and their slayers in one terrific glare. Some already wished that the altar smoke could cover the deed from the sight of heaven. But one of the rangers a man of sanctified aspect, though his hands were bloody approached the captain, Sir, said he, our village meeting house lacks a bell, and hitherto we have been faint to summon the good people to worship by beat of drum. Give me, I pray you, the bell of this popish chapel, for the sake of the godly Mr. Rogers, who doubtless hath remembered us in the prayers of the congregation, ever since we began our march. Who can tell what share of this night's good success we owe to that holy man's wrestling with the Lord? Nay, then, answered the captain, if good Mr. Rogers hath holpen our enterprise, it is right that he should share the spoil. Take the bell and welcome, Deacon Lawson, if you will be at the trouble of carrying it home. Hitherto it hath spoken nothing but papistry, and that too in the French or Indian gibberish, but I warrant me, if Mr. Rogers consecrate it anew, it will talk like a good English and Protestant bell. So Deacon Lawson and half a score of his townsmen took down the bell, suspended it on a pole, and bore it away on their sturdy shoulders meaning to carry it to the shore of Lake Champlain, and thence homeward by water. Far through the woods gleamed the flames of Our Lady's Chapel, flinging fantastic shadows from the clustered foliage, and glancing on brooks that had never caught the sunlight. As the rangers traversed the midnight forest, staggering under their heavy burden, the tongue of the bell gave many a tremendous stroke comma clang, clang, clang exclamation mark a most doleful sound, as if it were tolling for the slaughter of the priests and the ruin of the chapel. Little dreamed Deacon Lawson and his townsmen that it was their own funeral knell. A war party of Indians had heard the report, of musketry, and seen the blaze of the chapel, and now were on the track of the rangers, summoned to vengeance by the bell's dismal murmurs. In the midst of a deep swamp, they made a sudden onset on the retreating foe. Good Deacon Lawson battled stoutly, but had his skull cloven by a tomahawk, and sank into the depths of the morass, with the ponderous spell above him. And, for many a year thereafter, our hero's voice was heard no more on earth, neither at the hour of worship, nor at festivals nor funerals. And is he still buried in that unknown grave? Scarcely so, dear reader. Hark! How plainly we hear him at this moment, the spokesman of time, proclaiming that it is nine o'clock at night. We may therefore safely conclude that some happy chance has restored him to upper air. But the lay of the bell, for many silent years, and the wonder is, that we did not lie silent there a century, or perhaps a dozen centuries, till the world should have forgotten not only his voice, but the voices of the whole brotherhood of bells. How would the first accent of his own tongue have startled his resurrectionists? But he was not fated to be a subject of discussion among the antiquaries of far posterity. Near the close of the old French war, a party of New England axemen, who preceded the march of Colonel Brastreet toward Lake Ontario, were building a bridge of logs through a swamp. Plunging down a stake, one of these pioneers felt it graze against some hard, smooth substance. He called his comrades, and, by their united efforts, the top of the bell was raised to the surface, a rope made fast to it, and thence passed over the horizontal limb of a tree. Heave ho! Up they hoisted their prize, dripping with moisture, and festooned with verdant water moss. As the base of the bell emerged from the swamp, the pioneers perceived that a skeleton was clinging with its bony fingers to the clapper, but immediately relaxing its nerveless grasp, sank back into the stagnant water. The bell then gave forth a sullen clang. No wonder that he was in haste to speak, after holding his tongue for such a length of time. The pioneers shoved the bell to and fro, thus ringing a loud and heavy peal, which echoed widely through the forest, and reached the ears of Colonel Bradstreet, and his three thousand men. The soldiers paused on their march, a feeling of religion, mingled with born tenderness, overpowered their rude hearts, each seemed to hear the clangor of the old church bell, which had been familiar to hint from infancy, and had told at the funerals of all his forefathers. By what magic had that holy sound strayed over the wide murmuring ocean, and become audible amid the clash of arms, the loud crashing of the artillery over the rough wilderness path, and the melancholy roar of the wind among the boughs? The New Englanders hid their prize in a shadowy nook, betwixt a large grey stone and the earthy roots of an overthrown tree, and when the campaign was ended, they conveyed our friend to Boston and put him up at auction on the sidewalk of King Street. He was suspended, for the nonce, by a block and tackle, and being swung backward and forward, gave such loud and clear testimony to his own merits, that the auctioneer had no need to say a word. The highest bidder was a rich old representative from our town, who piously bestowed the bell on the meeting house where he had been a worshipper for half a century. The good man had his reward. By a strange coincidence, 
The very first duty of the sexton, after the bell had been hoisted into the belfry, was to toll the funeral knell of the donor. Soon, however, those doleful echoes were drowned by a triumphant peal for the surrender of Quebec. Ever since that period, our hero has occupied the same elevated station, and has put in his word on all matters of public importance, civil, military, or religious. On the day when independence was first proclaimed in the street beneath, he uttered a peal which many deemed ominous and fearful, rather than triumphant. But he has told the same story these sixty years, and none mistake his meaning now. When Washington, in the fullness of his glory, rode through our flower-strewn streets, this was the tongue that bade the father of his country welcome. Again the same voice was heard, when Lafayette came to gather in his half-century's harvest of gratitude. Meantime, vast changes have been going on below. His voice, which once floated over a little provincial seaport, is now reverberated between brick edifices, and strikes the ear amid the buzz and tumult of a city. On the Sabbaths of olden time, the summons of the bell was obeyed by a picturesque and varied throng, stately gentlemen in purple velvet coats, embroidered waistcoats, white twigs, and gold-laced hats, stepping with grave courtesy beside ladies in flowered satin gowns, and who petticoats of majestic circumference, while behind followed a liveried slave or bondsman, bearing the psalm book, and a stove for his mistress's feet. The commonalty, clad in homely garb, gave precedence to their betters at the door of the meeting house, as if admitting that there were distinctions between them, even in the sight of God. Yet, as their coffins were borne one after another through the street, the bell has told a requiem for all alike. What mattered it, whether or no there were a silver scudgeon on the coffin lid? Open thy bosom, Mother Earth! Thus spake the bell. Another of thy children is coming to his long rest. Take him to thy bosom, and let him slumber in peace. Thus spake the bell, and Mother Earth received her child. With the self-same tones will the present generation be ushered to the embraces of their mother, and Mother Earth will still receive her children. Is not thy tongue a weary, mournful talker of two centuries? O funeral bell! Wilt thou never be shattered with thine own melancholy strokes? Yea, and a trumpet call shall arouse the sleepers, whom thy heavy clank could awake no more, again again thy voice, reminding me that I am wasting the midnight oil. In my lonely fantasy, I can scarce believe that other mortals have caught the sound, or that it vibrates elsewhere than in my secret soul. But to many hast thou spoken? Anxious men have heard thee on their sleepless pillows, and bethought themselves anew of tomorrow's care. In a brief interval of wakefulness, the sons of toil have heard thee, and say, Is so much of our quiet slumber spent? Question mark, is the morning so near at hand? Crime has heard thee, and mutters, Now is the very hour. Despair answers thee, Thus much of this weary life is gone. The young mother, on her bed of pain and ecstasy, has counted thy echoing strokes, and dates from them her firstborn's share of life and immortality. The bridegroom and the bride have listened and feel that their night of rapture flits like a dream away. Thine accents have fallen faintly on the ear of a dying man, and warned him that, ere thou speakest again, his spirit shall have passed with a no voice of time can ever reach. Alas for the departing traveller, if thy voice the voice of fleeting time have taught him no lessons for eternity.